I've said it before and I'll say it again. I am an imposter. Regrettably, the more education you get, the more you learn your own ignorance. I wish I had another lifetime to accrue expertise in physics and mathematics and philosophy and a half dozen other areas of inquiry. For that matter, I could use another lifetime to travel the world, learn new languages and read literature. Many great thinkers have been made famous and influential to posterity by the extension of one or two novel contributions. So if I can have one or two of my own, I should be satisfied. What follows in today's episode is not one of them. I am not situated to produce a valid theory in the area of quantum physics, not even a little bit. In all likelihood, you, dear listener, know as much or more than me on this topic. But it is certainly of interest to speculate as best we can on the implications of the quantum world for the human mind. If nothing more can be gained, we might at least stretch out our thinking in the direction of further frontiers. I've read this to you from Philip Goff's book, Galileo's Error, but I'll share it again here to establish a starting point for the current discussion. Goff relays this passage from Arthur Eddington's book on philosophical idealism, The Nature of the Philosophical World. Quote, If we search the examination papers in physics and natural philosophy, for the more intelligible questions we may come across one beginning something like this. An elephant slides down a grassy hillside. The experienced candidate knows that he need not pay much attention to this. It is only put in to give us an impression of realism. He reads on, The mass of the elephant is two tons. Now we are getting down to business. The elephant fades out of the problem, and a mass of two tons takes its place. What is this two tons, the real subject matter of the problem? It is the reading of the pointer when the elephant was placed upon a weighing machine. Let us pass on. The slope of the hill is 60 degrees. Now the hillside fades out of the problem, and an angle of 60 degrees takes its place. What is 60 degrees? There is no need to struggle with mystical conceptions of direction. 60 degrees is the rendering of a plumb line against the divisions of a protractor, and so we see that the poetry fades out of the problem. And by the time the serious application of exact science begins, we are left with only pointer readings. Unquote. Goff's book stresses that physical science tells us nothing about the intrinsic nature of matter, only how matter behaves. Physics tells us what particles and fields and such do, not what they are fundamentally. I suppose it needn't come as a surprise, then, that at the smallest, deepest scales of measurement we discover unintuitive results. Quantum reality is decidedly strange, which is to say that it does not accord with what we should expect given classical theories and experiments in physics. But the brain's perceptual and cognitive capabilities did not evolve in favor of revealing fundamental truth. Natural selection is very pragmatic. What matters is what works. Donald Hoffman makes a strong argument on this point in his book, The Case Against Reality, in which he says, quote, To ask whether my perception of the moon is veridical, whether I see the true color, shape, and position of a moon that exists even when no one looks, is like asking whether the paintbrush icon in my graphics app reveals the true color, shape, and position of a paintbrush inside my computer. Our perceptions of the moon and other objects were not shaped to reveal, to reveal objective reality, but to disclose the one thing that matters in evolution, fitness payoffs. Physical objects are satisfying displays of crucial information about payoffs that govern our survival and reproduction. They are data structures that we create and destroy. The language of space and time, of physical objects with shapes, positions, momenta, spins, polarizations, colors, textures, and smells, is the right language to describe fitness payoffs, but it is fundamentally the wrong language to describe objective reality." Unquote. Brian Greene writes about quantum physics in his book, The Elegant Universe. I'll take some passages from it to put us in a quantum mood. I'm sure you are familiar enough with the double slit experiment. The upshot is that individual photons behave under some conditions as if they are particles, and under other conditions as if they are waves. Green writes, quote, Somehow photons, although they are particles, embody wave-like features of light as well. The fact that the energy of these particles is determined by a wave-like feature, frequency, is the first clue that a strange union is occurring. But the photoelectric effect and the double slit experiment really bring the lesson home. The photoelectric effect shows that light has particle properties. 
The double slit experiment shows that light manifests the interference properties of waves. Together, they show that light has both wave-like and particle-like properties. The microscopic world demands that we shed our intuition that something is either a wave or a particle and embrace the possibility that it is both. It is here that Feynman's pronouncement that nobody understands quantum mechanics comes to the fore. We can utter words such as wave-particle duality. We can translate these words into a mathematical formalism that describes real-world experiments with amazing accuracy, but it is extremely hard to understand at a deep, intuitive level this dazzling feature of the microscopic world." Unquote. In the subsequent section, Green describes experiments using electrons to show that even matter has both wave-like and particle-like properties. He writes, quote, Inspired by a chain of reasoning rooted in Einstein's special relativity, de Broglie suggested that the wave-particle duality applied not only to light, but to matter as well. He reasoned, roughly speaking, that Einstein's E equals mc squared relates mass to energy, that Planck and Einstein had related energy to the frequency of waves, and therefore, by combining the two, mass should have a wave-like incarnation as well. After carefully working through this line of thought, he suggested that just as light is a wave phenomenon that quantum theory shows to have an equally valid particle description, an electron, which we normally think of as being a particle, might have an equally valid description in terms of waves." Unquote. Green describes the experiments and then continues, quote, Although we described this in the case of electrons, similar experiments lead to the conclusion that all matter has a wave-like character. But how does this jibe with our real-world experience of matter as being solid and sturdy, and in no way wave-like? Well, de Broglie set down a formula for the wavelength of matter waves, and it shows that the wavelength is proportional to Planck's constant. Since Planck's constant is so small, the resulting wavelengths are similarly minuscule compared with everyday scales. This is why the wave-like char character of matter becomes directly apparent only upon careful microscopic investigation. Just as the large value of c, the speed of light, obscures much of the true nature of space and time, the smallness of Planck's constant obscures the wave-like aspects of matter in the day-to-day -day world." Unquote. I have argued, notably in episode 3, but throughout this podcast, that human consciousness must serve a function. I am unmoved by arguments that our consciousness is epiphenomenal, and I have previously, on more than one occasion, justified this position. Rather than going over the case again here, I refer you to episode 3. For today's discussion, I will assume that consciousness serves a function. That is, consciousness is not a side effect of thalamocortical brain function, but is causally integral. It makes a difference. I hypothesize that consciousness enables an emergent level of causal power which acts by means which are ultimately quantum. This is not to necessitate the, that consciousness itself is a quantum level problem. Rather, I am suggesting that the problem of conscious will might have an answer at that level. First, this hypothesis is no great leap. If at the local atomic and subatomic level everything acts by means of quantum mechanics, then willful consciousness must do so as well. Second, and to my good fortune, I am not the first to have made such a supposition, so the hypothesis is by no means original. In fact, David Chalmers, the philosopher who gave us the term the hard problem of consciousness, recently published a paper on the topic with his colleague Kelvin McQueen. The title is Consciousness and the Collapse of the Wave Function. I'll share some of it with you here. Let's start with the initial framing of the paper in the introduction, which I think does a pretty good job of summing things up. Quote, One of the hardest philosophical problems arising from contemporary science is the problem of quantum reality. What is going on in the physical reality underlying the predictions of quantum mechanics? It is widely accepted that quantum mechanical systems are describable by a wave function. The wave function need not specify definite properties for a system. Instead, it may specify that the system is in a superposition of multiple values for position, momentum, and other properties. When one measures these properties, however, one always obtains a definite result. On a common picture, the wave function is guided by two separate principles. First, there is a process of evolution according to the Schrodinger equation, which is linear, deterministic, and constantly ongoing. Second, there is a process of collapse into a definite state, which is nonlinear, non-deterministic, and happens only on certain occasions of measurement. This picture is standardly accepted at least as a basis for empirical predictions, but it has been less popular as a story about the underlying physical reality. 
the biggest problem is the measurement problem. On this picture, a fundamental measurement collapse principle says that collapses happen when and only when a measurement occurs. But on the face of it, the notion of measurement is vague and anthropocentric and is inappropriate to play a role in a fundamental specification of reality. To make sense of quantum reality, one needs a much clearer specification of the underlying dynamic processes." Unquote. What exactly is meant by taking a measurement? In some sense, it must mean interacting causally with the object being measured. It doesn't seem possible to me to get a measure of something without being in a cause-effect relationship with it. Suppose a photon strikes a screen at a particular location and causes a reaction where uh, that can be detected. That would tell us that at that exact moment the photon was located at that precise location, but clearly the photon had to interact with our screen in order for us to know its location. I find the idea of superposition, the subatomic particles having an indeterminate location in space, most intuitive when I consider the so-called electron cloud of an atom. We all remember the model from chemistry of an atom with its protons and neutrons crammed into the nucleus and the electrons orbiting around the nucleus at some distance. This distance is where we get the notion that atoms are mostly empty space. If I understand the quantum physicists correctly, and I might not because it is hardly my area of expertise, the electrons do not have a definite position. They aren't really in orbit around the nucleus of the atom. Rather, as long as they are not being measured, the electrons are literally spread throughout the domain which surrounds the nucleus. Their position is better understood as a waveform. But upon being interfered with by a device of measurement, an electron collapses into a single position such that we get a definite particle at a definite location. Chalmers and McQueen proposed that consciousness might function in the collapsing of such waveforms. In the following passage, I have omitted the formulas from the quote to make it easier to follow the argument. The authors write, quote, The key idea here is that consciousness is a superposition-resistant property and that its physical correlates therefore resist superposition uh, too. That is, it is difficult or impossible for a subject to be in a superposition of two different states of consciousness, and this results in the collapse of physical processes that interact with consciousness. Here, the relevant states are total conscious states of a subject at a time. The total conscious state of a subject is what it is like to be that subject. If what it is like to be subject A is the same as what it is like to be subject B, then A and B are in the same total conscious state. A subject's total conscious state at a time may include many aspects, visual experience, auditory experience, the experience of thought, and so on. Like position or mass or color or shape, consciousness in this form can take on many specific values. Its specific values are the vast range of possible total conscious states of a subject at a time. This view assumes a tight correlation between total states of consciousness and physical states. For simplicity, we can start by assuming a materialist view where the total conscious state and its physical correlate are identical. Things work best if we also assume that the physical correlate of consciousness can itself be represented as a quantum observable. This assumption is non-trivial, as not every physical property is an observable. A physical correlate of consciousness, observable, will have many different eigenstates corresponding to distinct states of consciousness. This makes it straightforward to treat consciousness as a super-resistant property. To illustrate how this works, we can again suppose an electron in a superposition of locations. The electron registers on a measurement device, and then the result is perceived by a human subject. Assuming the measurement device is not conscious, then at the first stage the electron and the device will go into an entangled state. When the human looks, this result will affect the eye, early areas of the nervous system and brain, and eventually the physical correlates of consciousness. Under Schrodinger evolution, we would expect the electron, device, and subject to go into an entangled state. However, this superposed state would yield a superposition of states of consciousness, so at the point where the physical correlate of consciousness is affected, the system will collapse. In effect, at the point where the measurement reaches consciousness, the electron, the, measure, the measurement device, and the brain will collapse into a definite state." Unquote. A little further on, they say, quote, One motivation for the super-resistance consciousness collapse model is given by Wigner's suggestion that superpositions of consciousness are absurd. That is, something about the very nature of consciousness, or the concept of consciousness, rules out total states where consciousness is superposed. It is certainly at least very hard to imagine subjects who are in superposed consciousness at least without these states becoming total states of consciousness in their own right. 
If something about the nature of consciousness explains why it cannot be superposed, then this might provide a possible explanation of why collapse comes about. This explanatory motivation might be seen as a further motivation for understanding consciousness as the trigger of collapse." Unquote. All right, let's see if I can make some sense of this proposal. They said that the measuring device and the electron in question will enter an entangled state. I guess this means that both the electron and the measurement depend upon one another, but remain in an undetermined state. They would have us believe that upon observation of the measurement by a conscious subject, the waveform will collapse and a definite result will appear. I'm sorry to say that I find this idea really hard to swallow. They also suggest that consciousness might be resistant to superposition. I'll have that. It's a reasonable hypothesis anyway. After all, when we look at a Necker cube, we can only see one form of the image at a time, either the lower square in the front surface of the cube or the upper square in the front is the front surface of the cube. I have pointed out that this is a good example of how consciousness presents coherently. The evidence seems to show that subatomic particles really exist at least much of the time in superposition in space-time. Further, the evidence shows that measurement always yields a determinate position for those particles. I'm not in any position to argue with that evidence, so how shall we proceed to interpretation? For the sake of discussion, I am going to make an argument on these grounds. We all intuitively understand the idea of cause and effect. Science and reason are totally dependent on this concept. Ultimately, though, what is causality? It is the manner in which one thing influences another in space moving forward in time. When one large object impacts another large object, it seems to me that all the real business of interaction between the objects must occur at a subatomic level. Electrons on one object repel electrons on the other and vice versa. This is why even though the atoms that compose matter are mostly empty space, they nevertheless do not pass through one another. They interact analogous to billiard balls. But the analysis I have just provided suggests that causality must really occur among subatomic things and thus at a quantum level. By extension, all causality must occur at a quantum level. I have argued that consciousness is an emergent property of the thalamocortical system. I have further claimed that consciousness is a massive structure of integrated causality. I am a physicalist in the sense that I claim consciousness is an entirely physical phenomenon. Perhaps Chalmers and McQueen have it right that consciousness is resistant to superposition. They claim that consciousness can trigger the collapse of waveforms. This would provide a mechanism for how consciousness functions in the world. However, I think that even if this is true, consciousness is probably not necessary for the collapse of waveforms. Suppose that independent subatomic particles naturally behave as the quantum physicists have told us. They are not in definite positions traveling in definite directions at definite speeds and so on. Independently, such subatomic structures tend to occur in the form of waves. Further, suppose that more than one subatomic particle can join together as an entangled structure which still exhibits a waveform. The components are part of a common indeterminate structure. But suppose that collapse of the waveform occurs whenever a large enough structure of causally integrated components comes together. Under the weight, if you like, or the tension of so much interdependency, the superposition cannot hold and the waveform collapses. This account would allow that a measuring device could, on its own, implicate the entangled constituents in a large enough structure of causal relations to force the collapse. Perhaps consciousness as a large structure of integrated causality operates in this way, too. Brian Greene said that, Just as the large value of C, the speed of light, obscures much of the true nature of space and time, the smallness of Planck's constant obscures the wave-like aspects of matter in the day-to-day -day world. Perhaps human consciousness is such a massive complex of integrated causality that it obscures the wave-collapsing power it exhibits. I regret that I am not in the position to speak with authority on this topic, because I think it is really important. In a section of his book, The Mystery of Consciousness, John Searle is giving a critical account of Roger Penrose, and he says the following, quote, There are several attempts besides Penrose's to give a quantum mechanical account of consciousness. The standard complaint is that these accounts, in effect, want to substitute, substitute two mysteries for one." Unquote. I rarely disagree with John Searle, but here I have to make this point. What if the two mysteries, quantum mechanics and functional consciousness, are in fact related? Then the opposite of his criticism would apply. Two great scientific mysteries could be solved at once. Mm -hmm.